Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we might start because time will probably go particularly quickly, I would suggest, uh, and also because this is such an interesting topic. And I must say, the reaction I have got when I have shared this particular question that we're going to explore this evening has been quite remarkable, and everyone's sort of gone, ooh, that's interesting. So I'm sure, and I'm hoping tonight, will in fact be interesting. And not only will it be interesting, I'm hoping that it will be informed as well too. Speaking as someone who is passionate about education, as I know, everyone on the panel, and I know a number of you out there are as well. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on Wurundjeri land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. And in this part of Melbourne, we are very, very closely connected to uh, the Wurundjeri spirit. I'd also like to acknowledge the Australian College of Educators. I know we have a number of people from the Victorian State Committee here, and um, I thank them for their involvement in, uh, in this particular event. And if you're not a member of ACE, I would strongly encourage you to be so. It is the professional organisation that represents the Catholic, the government and the independent sector everyone from early learning right through to university. So it's a, I was very involved and I'm still involved and it is an extraordinary organisation. I'd like to also acknowledge the Parents and Friends Association who have been a part of today. And I saw Shemaine sneaking somewhere. There she is hiding over there. So thank you very much to those people that have helped with the refreshments. Um, likewise, the other schools and organisations that are represented here today, and we have a number of people from organisations like uh, Independent Schools Victoria, the Victorian Institute of Teachers, as well as a number of others. It is an uh, inaugural event for the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, and just a few very quick words about that. It is the case that CELT, as we are tending to call it, the Centre of Excellence in Learning and Teaching, has been established to firstly encourage the dialogue in the community between academics, teachers and families about the education of our young people, to strengthen the link between university research and classroom practice for the benefit of our students, thirdly to strengthen the, or contribute to the strengthening of the profession of educators at all levels, ELC through to tertiary, hence our delight in being associated with ACE, and hopefully to contribute to the educational landscape that can, uh, supports the continued improvement of education for the young people in our care. CELT is also linked, by the way, to the Victorian School for the Performing Arts, which is also housed at the school. Uh, and I'd like to think that there's a sort of a balance there because the Victorian School for the Performing Arts fosters the more esoteric and aesthetic side of life and, uh, and delves into promoting music, drama and philosophical thought. Before we start, I'd just like a sort of a rough sense of who we've got in the audience. Firstly, May and uh, the different categories are, I'll give you advance notice, connected with a school, connected with a university, a parent, uh, or maybe a professional organisation. So those that are teachers in schools, for want of a better word, may I just have a sense? Because this helps pitch how we go. Uh, those who are associated with university, thank you. Those who are parents, who are just really interested in this area. Terrific, great to see you. And those who are involved in professional organisations that perhaps don't fit into our, like any of those categories. Fabulous. You can see we've got quite a broad range and that is wonderful because it means that every group will have a particular, dare I say it, take or perspective on what it is we're going to talk about. And can I point out how rarely it is that one gets an opportunity like this to have parents and teachers and university people and professional organisations all interacting on a common topic. So hopefully you'll find it, as I said, provocative, um, interesting and I'd like to suggest informed. Uh, I think that you may have read enough about the different presenters but I'm going to speak very, very briefly about them. I'll start with Meg Fortington. Meg, on my left here, has recently joined the school. She is an identified leading teacher in the Department of Education, which is the top level a teacher can get to in the state. She's and has operated as a consultant, particularly in the areas of the use of ICT in transforming teaching and learning. So welcome, Meg. We have Dr. Scott Webster, who's at Deakin University. He's an expert in pedagogy, curriculum, and professional learning. And uh, one of the things that really strikes me about Scott is his, it sounds like equally strong interest in things like ethics, values, 
spirituality and the meaning of life and hopefully we'll get a chance to explore that. <laughs> Linda Shardlow, uh, who is one of the very few teachers in Victoria that has been deemed highly accomplished. Uh, for those of you that are involved in the profession will know there's a set of standards and Linda was one of the people that went through those first hurdles through the school in that instance um, and the school deemed her to be highly accomplished. It was an interesting um, exercise, wasn't it? And it was linked to um, salary. So uh, some of you may have some questions about how that was organised and that was in a Victorian independent school. And then my great delight to introduce Aidan Pereira and Julia Burke. Aidan and Julia are very uh, valuable and esteemed members of the school community, as, of, uh, as are all the students, of course. And I know we've already been having a bit of a chat, haven't we, about what might happen tonight. But as we know, in these things, nobody really knows. So we'll give it a go. Um, why, why we chose this topic, I will share. This was when I was doing something for ACE, and we were talking about this, what makes a good teacher. And there was a principal, and I won't name the school, of a very well-respected school in Australia, um, that said, look, good teachers just have that X factor. Now, I was appalled when I heard that, because I thought, this day and age, surely we can talk and articulate better what it means to be a good teacher. And this was around the time that the national standards were coming in, and yet there was a leader in our educational community who was talking about X factors. It's like saying, I know they're learning because of the lights in their eyes. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough either. So how do we move the conversation on? I know that, uh, and forgive me those that have heard this story before, for me as an educator, it's my second career, I was a research scientist, I am over those dinner parties where you sit down and within minutes they find out you're a teacher and you talk about <laughs> 10 weeks holiday, finishing <laughs> at 3.30 and then they bring in the fact, oh come on, anyone can teach. Yeah. Now, at that point, and I've started taking them with me, I actually take the national standards to dinner parties <laughs> and I pull them out and I say to someone, so how would you do whatever it is, 4.3.2? And then I find it actually works really well because people realise that it has changed. It has changed a lot. And I would suggest we've had more change in education in the last, well, since about 2008, than we have in the previous 150 years. Things like the Charter for the Profession, the teaching, the, obviously, the national standards. We've had a Charter for Professional Learning. We've had the Teacher Performance and Development Framework. We also have the Melbourne Declaration, which followed a number of other declarations, which starts to really unpack why we do what we do. Now, I'm a bit sorry in some ways that our profession had not really dug down and explored those things previously. But it is a different world. That's the point I'm making to, I would say, about 10 years ago in this space. And that's a good thing. So, over to the panel, and I'm going to sit down at this point. And I think I might just uh, share, this is from a parenting site. So it suggested a good teacher was organised, prepared, clear learning objectives, able to engage and inspire, have high expectations for all students, develop strong relationships with students, and know their subject matter. And I'm not going to ask what we think I was going to ask, I'm going to ask me, what's missing from that list? <laughs> so no wonder I'm tired. No, <laughs> I, I, that list is, um, a good list for a good teacher. However, in 2018, um, when we talk about contemporary learning expectations of our students, um, that then translates, of course, to what myself as a teacher is required to do. So some of the things that I would add to that list would be a connected collaborator. Um, if I'm not connected to other, there's a, if you haven't seen it, there is an amazing network of teachers around the globe who generously give of their ideas, and there's just wonderful networks of teachers out there who share um, what they're doing in their classrooms. And yes, I have to bring it back to my context, but there's so many great ideas out there. I should say that I teach in technology types of subjects. So for me, um, constantly learning has to be on that list as well. A critical reflector, somebody who can be always looking at what else is next. Um, and I, probably the primary thing is to be an outstanding learner. I cannot possibly know everything in my classroom. 
There's at least three or four different editing software that we use. There's coding, which in just the last five years I've, I've been teaching in a classroom, which I certainly never learned when I was at university. So I guess as a, a really strong learner, I'm constantly um, creating opportunities for my students, but I'm also learning myself. And through that, taking risks and showing that taking a risk in my classroom to try something I haven't done before um, and to use technology in a new way, I'm actually modelling what I expect of my students. That's a few things to add to the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, to us, the young people at the end, Amy or Julia, do you think there's anything either missing from the list or, or was there one of those things that really jumped out at you as being particularly the most important thing? Um, personally, not the most important, but the one that actually jumped out as being less so important was that having good relationships with your students. Now, when I thought of that, I immediately thought of um, seeing a teacher as a friend almost, but I don't think that's necessary for a teacher. As long as a teacher is respected by the student and is approachable, that's when that's as far as the relationship needs to go, I believe. How do you think a teacher can earn respect? I think a teacher can earn respect through motivating their students, whether that be through seeing that they can achieve the best they can and seeing that I'm always pushing them beyond their limits because once once a student can see that then they then they respect the teacher for seeing that in them and they are motivated to do the same to work hard just like the teacher. So Julia picking up on what Aidan said, so sort of that extension of the students you think is important too to get respect of the teacher by the students? Definitely I think that teachers um are um, most respected when they can tailor their teaching to individual students. So when they recognise that not all their students will be at the same level or um, learning the same way as others, when they can accommodate to different students in the class and do different things that suit other people, that definitely gains the students' respect. They're like, oh, this teacher actually does care for my performance and actually wants to accommodate to what I learn best. Now, I might bring Linda in at this stage. How does a teacher do what Julia is talking about? What sorts of things might a teacher do to show that they do know where each of their children is at? In my mind, I think we need to think about three things. A teacher leaning into their class. What does that mean? It means taking notice of where every student is at within that particular class. And of course, Dylan William will talk about very good formative assessment being the key to knowing where every student is at. Because if you don't know where every student is at by determining prior knowledge, then you're not going to know where the level of challenge is for each student. So you can't personalise that level of challenge until you actually determine where each kid is at when they come into the class in front of you. So determining prior <coughs> knowledge is part of leaning in. It's taking notice of what's happening within that classroom and taking notice of where every kid is at at that particular journey. But then a teacher has to step up. So what does excellence look like? How do you define what an excellent classroom looks like? You've got to be, as Meg said, the best learner in every single classroom that you walk into. And what the teacher is learning about is how their students are tracking in relation to the curriculum that you're trying to teach them, as well as other things that might be going on in that classroom dynamic. And then once you've stepped up and you know what the excellence looks like, which is why the standards have been developed, then you've got to reach out and go for those networks that Meg was also talking about, because you can't possibly know everything. You've got to use the world, use the team to change the team, in the same way that you use your class members to change what's happening there. Now, some of the people in the audience may not know the specific reference in the standards, and I think we're talking about six and seven here primarily. Um, Linda, are you happy to just touch on, or maybe Scott, um, just touch on the key elements of those two latter standards? Professional <coughs> knowledge. Um, yeah, the standards are basically divided into three areas. One is uh, professional knowledge, like the things that teachers are meant to know. The other one is what teachers are meant to do, their behaviours, their performance. The last one is uh, professional learning, so their contribution as a professional learner as somebody who's contributing in such a way that they see themselves as not having all the answers, but continually has already been flagged very clearly, having to learn, having to learn from each and every individual student they're working with, learning from colleagues, learning from the school environment, 
learning often from professional literature, learning from professional associations. So it's constant learning. And that's one of the attributes then of you know, the standards of what we look at. So definitely not somebody who's a finished product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, I've got a little saying for me, which is I'm only ever as good as my last lesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you think you're okay, but often you're not. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in fact, two out of the seven standards are based on teachers learning, and some in the audience may not know that. And I think that is a good thing for parents to know. And indeed, I know one of the things I suggest when parents are deciding between schools for their children, and it's a huge decision, is asking what and how the, pair, uh, the teachers actually learn. How much time and energy is put into developing the teachers in a school uh, and what approach do they have to their own learning as well too. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly one of the, the rationales behind the formation of this uh, particular centre mm -hmm. that we're doing. One of the things that we do hear a lot about is the importance of content knowledge as opposed to pedagogical or teaching knowledge, the capacity, uh, the difference, and I know that um, this was touched on by Scott, you know, how important is it to have good content knowledge versus how, in, and I hate that word, sorry, but um, how important is it to understand the pedagogical knowledge, the way we teach? So, for instance, I'm a biology teacher. That means, and a philosophy teacher. That means I know all the case of philosophy, not so much. But the case of biology, a lot. And I'd like to say, in the, in the space of, of pedagogical knowledge, a fair bit as well too, though constantly learning. If we were to put, and this is a new question, a percentage, and I'll start with Scott, on those two areas, what do you think that percentage might be? And it's a rotten question. It's a rotten question, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I might sidestep the percentage, but maybe just a uh, suggestion, you know, how comfortable, there's a lot of parents in the room, how comfortable we'd be as parents having engineers come into the classrooms and say, I'm here to teach maths. Okay, or how many uh, biologists in the field are coming in to teach biology. And certainly you're right, they would know the content knowledge. But it's another thing, as we've already flagged, to be able to relate to students in such a way. It reminds me of um, the United States, Jerome Bruno was involved in 1969. The Russians had just sent up Sputnik and the Americans were panicked, we don't have enough uh, science and math happening in the school. And so they started this huge program of getting all the scientists together, breaking down scientific knowledge into all the, the bits that fitted logically. And Jerome was there as sort of a psychologist to help them how to fit it together. And um, he describes this in the book called uh, Process of Education. And he brought out another edition in 1977 where he redid the preface and he says, oh, the pedagogical knowledge was not there. He describes it as all being airy-fairy, totally out of touch, didn't appreciate the political environment, the social environment of human beings. So when it comes to the knowledge, somebody can really know the knowledge, but at the end of the day, we can reduce that to, well, knowledge can be in books. But if we're wanting human beings to engage with that, then there's a study of what it is to be a human being. Why would a be human being want to engage with this in the first place? As a community, why are we valuing that particular kind of knowledge? And uh, so you've asked me earlier for a percentage. I, you know, if I play safe and go 50-50. <laughs> you must know your content, yes, no yeah. doubt about it. And, but you must remember that the context is one of education. I mean, we, we've got uh, classic examples, you know, concentration camps, uh, where we had very talented nurses, doctors, engineers commit horrendous crimes. And it's that missing out of the human element that as educators, we want them to strive in it. So a very, very important dimension that we as a society should never ever lose, and there are pressures to lose it. Actually, it's fascinating you should say that because the year 10s are in here today doing a session on the Holocaust. Oh, right, okay. So it's quite timely because I was part of that sort of listening uh, okay. in. Yeah. So could you take that a step further and say, all right, so um, how could we, or I think you've covered the should, but yeah. how could we, now maybe there's a should in there as well, yeah. work with the young people so that those elements of almost being yeah. a good person uh, yes, well that's right. When, when we talk about good teaching, we're going to say, well, good for what? Yes. 
Is it good for filling their minds with information that they can replicate in an exam and get a good ATAR score, and that's the name of the game, full stop? Or we say, no, no, you're working with the younger generation to be good people, to participate in society, civilization, so it might be better. That's got to be the overriding discourse. If we're not promoting a sense of democracy, fairness, looking after the, the vulnerable within our society, then the whole push in knowledge is really missed again. Mm -hmm. And so what it is to be a good person has got to be fundamental to, I mean, we talk about the intellectual virtues. They're, mm -hmm. they're no different to the moral virtues. Uh, we're asking somebody to politely listen. Is that an intellectual virtue or is that a moral virtue? Well, it's all part of being a virtuous person. Because if you learn, you will be listening to somebody. And if you apply to well-mannered, you'll also listen. So the idea of being moral and being intellectual is, is not that different at all. They're very much intertwined. Do you think we should teach the moral virtues through the intellectual virtues? Yes, obviously, yes, yes. Because any kind of division, uh, you know, you will start to lose your students because they say, well, why are we engaging with this? Mm -hmm. Too very fair. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You two. Have you, in your time on earth and at school, have you ever felt that that kind of message was getting, uh, being taught to you or something that you have absorbed without uh, concrete or explicit teaching? Um, I think that um, in more recent years, teachers have been more focused on not just knowing the content but understanding it which I guess kind of fits in there, not just being able to recite facts and to repeat information, but understanding it and then being able to have um, the most important part of your own interpretation. So learning to form your own opinion, to uh, interpret things like in your own way. I think that's been a lot more focused and that kind of touches on that, not just knowing the content and being able to relay information. Because I can jump in here because what's really important is when we start talking about what is knowledge and it's not inert objective information, it's contestable. Mm. And so when we talk about the theory of whatever, the idea of whatever, we are engaging with, hang on, there's multiple ways of understanding this. And so as educators, we want our students to appreciate, hang on, this is not all cut and dry, it's contestable. And you need to be able to participate in the conversations as to why you believe the world is flat, round, or whatever the belief is, with an understanding that people will believe differently. <clears throat> so it's this opportunity to engage in the conversation in a respectful way with other people, not simply block paste memorize. So it's great to get on that experience. Mm. I was listening to a really interesting discussion about uh, driverless cars. And driverless cars, we know the technology is there, but presumably a human has got to code them or program them or whatever. So that if a car's driving along and there's a cat or a wall, it may make, someone has to decide, if you hit the cat, there's probably less damage to the car, so the insurance companies will be happier than if you hit the wall. You replace the cat with the child, what do you do? And I know for me, one of the terrifying things is artificial intelligence and where that might lead and I'm interested in, and, and again, sorry, um, Scott, but I think you might be the best person here. So artificial intelligence is probably not the answer to the future of humanity, is it? Or, or is it? Well, it's always going to be limited by the algorithms and the algorithm yes. writers who, who put it together. They talk about, you know, they can learn, but yes, it's only adjusting those algorithms that are already set in. I think what you're touching is, you know, what is it to be an ethical being? And, you know, if you're the, the person behind the wheel, you make the judgment between the cat, the kid, the wall, or whatever. And the, the problematic thing with ethics, there is no right-wrong. Mm. Sometimes there's competing rights. And you have to think, well, what's more right than the other ones? And you have to do that without any kind of authority telling you. So you have to be responsible and just say, well, and you have to give an answer for that. Why did you choose this one or those two? We talk the educated press and say, well, here's my reasoning, here's my thinking, here's my sensitivity, how I put it all together, as opposed to, oh, just an algorithm just told me to do that, mm. because then we become less than human. Do you think we put enough time in schools working with young people to help them make those sorts of decisions? And I'm going to ask the young people in the team mm. too. Amy, what do you think? Do you think that is 
something that you are still either haven't done or learning to do about how do you make the best decisions? I don't really understand the question. Okay, do you think, and I think that might be part of the answer, in actual fact. <laughs> um, and indeed, because it is a skill, is it not? Uh, yeah, so perhaps I might, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, to Scott if I could then. Do you think we teach enough of it in schools, and if we were to teach it, how might we do it? Uh, no, we don't teach enough in schools. Hmm. Why do I say that? Uh, I work with first year university students who want to get into education. And time and time again, they tell me to succeed, to get high ATAR scores. It's high content driven, it's a matter of memorizing huge amounts of information to give it back. And it's no fault of the individual teachers, it's, it's part of the system. And so I'm working with them in the first year to try to unpack that. And one of the first things I, uh, I try to raise their awareness is, is when they come through a system, they almost come into a form of dualistic thinking. And it's been able to sort of get them to move beyond the right, the wrong, the good, the bad, the us and the end, mm -hmm. and then to the idea of, well, life is complex. And they need to be able to find a, a responsible voice by which they feel they can participate. And um, sometimes that means putting students in the deep end, but of course that takes a bit of time. And in school where there's so much high pressure, I can appreciate that's, that's a difficult thing to do. But if it's done in the younger years, from our own experience, students themselves will change. Um, when I was working with younger grades in high school, I didn't want the, the students to trust me, as in blind trust. Mm. So I tried to convince them, the world is flat. <laughs> you don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? What are you drawing on to challenge my belief? And so I would take that approach with the students, so, you know, the devil's advocate kind of approach. And what I didn't want the students to do was block, paste, and copy the authority of the teacher or the textbook but continue to challenge them, say, well, why are you really saying that? You know, why do you really think three times five is 15? And so it's great you're sort of flagging, well, you, you've got the understanding of the knowledge. And I think if that happens in a young enough grade, mm -hmm. where philosophy, etc., then as students go through the higher grades, especially 11 and 12, there is a bit more space there if they're already attuned to say, okay, all the content that we're dealing with can be challenged, mm -hmm. can be problematic. Mm -hmm. It's no matter of block based the problem. Linda, you made an interesting comment before we came into the hall about, we were talking about the education for an ATAR versus, if you like, education to be a good person. Your comment was interesting. Can you remember what you said? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what she said. <laughs> she said, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to justify, um, because you did actually comment that you believed it can be both. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I, I think that there are a lot of false dichotomies in education. I think it's important that you do consider that sometimes, you know, it's not this or that, that it should be a combination of both, a melding if you like. But I, I would like to pick up on your comment about being responsible. And I like the original definition of the word responsible, which is response-able. So if we can train students to be able to respond to those situations, and I think my why, and I, I've been going on at the staff a lot at the beginning of this year about determining what is your why? Why are you teaching? Why are you teaching your particular discipline when it comes to the secondary subject? If you have your why, then I think that anchors you in all sorts of things. And my why is to develop young people who have a sense of agency, that they have a sense of autonomy, that they have enough knowledge to believe that they have the capacity to go out into the world and change it for the better. And if we teach in response-able ways rather than content delivery ways, which has been the old model and tends to go towards, if you're maybe the ATAR type mindset, that you're teaching to get a particular mark for these students at the end of year 12, that's only a very limiting view of education in my view, because it only goes to the end of year 12. And then you've got this gate that happens to get into university. That's an important gate. But as you go on, <coughs> if we're going to be a nation that really respects learning and produces learners that are capable of going on to change the world in positive ways, we have to teach in that way. And yes, 
eight hours are important, but I think you can still teach the content in a way that makes students more response able and a sense of agency in there. But you've got to be purposeful about it and mindful about it. Now, I did see a hand up at the back. I think we, and we're happy to take comments. Oh, good. Um, and I respect that reply and comment, and I agree with it, but then you've got to realise, how is that teacher judged? How is that teacher um, taken, you know, obviously, if all her students don't get a high ATAR, well, then that teacher is judged on, well, she didn't do a good job. In layman's terms, you know? So you yeah. still... So that's, I agree with everything you said, but then let's go back to how is that teacher? And that is a very common response uh, in the general community, absolutely. And I think that's why, and I, I see another hand up there, Haley, be with you in the tip. But I'm actually going to ask Linda to explain the sort of triangulation of evidence that we use to, to actually work with what a good teacher is. Um, we will try, and when you're judging, um, we ask teachers to be assessed in a professional learning way, there's an element of support for that teacher on a developmental paradigm, but there's also, I think, an element of push. You're not gonna get anywhere unless you push people to get somewhere. So to provide all of those things, what we would like to do within the professional learning framework is to ensure that teachers self-reflect against a set of standards it could be the Australian professional standards, it could be what we come up with as a group as defining what an ideal classroom looks like at this school, what should be involved in every single instructional lesson. It's about observations, and there are observations for different purposes, and you might want to do a range of those. It's about student voice. What do the students feel that they're getting out of each of those um, lessons that they have? So we try and get those measures of the teacher sort of trying to work out where they are, as well as the leadership team, if you like, helping them along that way. And when you come to look at something like the VCE data, it's imperative, I think, to look at the growth measures. There are certain reports that come out from VCA, and the ones that I think make the most difference are the ones that show where each of those children's results lie in comparison to the GATT. Some schools call that the value added. I don't like that term either, but that's what it's usually referred to. So there are a number of measures of which those sorts of teaching aspects can be assessed. And I don't know that a number of them actually make it into the media. I think the ones like school rankings and the percentage of scores above 40 for each of the schools are quite um, shallow measures. Yes, and, 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 and I would absolutely agree with that. And, and that brings in to play the NAPLAN schools and mm. so on, which people may, um, well, I know the teachers and educators in the room will know parents may have or may not be comfortable with this, but it is quite sad how the NAPLAN results, which were meant as a snapshot for the teacher to then go, okay, I think this child needs a bit more development here, or I'll work with them on this, has just been totally hijacked in a way and the sad bit is, and I face this as a head of school, when a parent will come in and say, oh, you know, a certain school, other school is 0.03% higher in terms of map and results, therefore we're going to pull our children out of the school that they happen to be at because obviously that one's a better school. And it's so sad, it's a bit like at, um, at my last school, a child left, went to another school, kept the uh, sibling at, the, at my then school, came back and, and I said, how's she going? Mum said, fabulous. She was getting C's with you, now she's getting all A's. She's doing much better. Now, anyone with the knowledge of education, yes, will shake their heads at that because they know that something dodgy's gone on. Thank you, sorry. I'm going back to the, the, the ATAR and, you know, I, I've worked in a middle school and I've now moved down to a junior school, so I'm sort of seeing how that, that works. I walk, walked across all the sections and I do know that basically after year 10, there's a lot of um, 
resistance to to the, the moral teaching and the and the being a good human. And although we, we try to do it very well where we are, at the end of the day, it is all about that number. And while schools tend to wear the, the stress of that, maybe it's time that the university started to look at what do we value, what skills are we valuing in our children so that we can actually do the things that you're talking about and not risk them not getting into a university. And I know IB, International Baccalaureate, tends to allow for a lot more of that student-driven learning and inquiry. Um, you know, why aren't we putting a value or a score on community service or, or a score on, on your, your, your values and how you've contributed to your community? That doesn't count for anything when those results come out and those children are graded. It's, it's a great time for me to hop in and say, that's why I've got to say at this school we're developing a certificate of global citizenship that will sit alongside the VCE that will pick up on some of those elements that you are talking about and they'll also have some philosophical and um, elements in there as well, intercultural understanding, focus on communication and languages um, as, uh, and, and that sort of other stuff if you like because we do believe it sure. is very but important. If they don't get that number, then what does okay. that count for? I'm going to ping to Stuart, who I know works at universities. <laughs> Some universities are moving away from just looking at ATARs, aren't they, Stuart? Well, ACU has is, is been like that for ages. So we, we accept the, and I work in education, obviously, and we, we have low ATARs. And one of the things we're trying to strive for is that student who has more than just the ATAR. And we'll, we'll provide pathways where they do, you know, what you call a, a, a year where they do tertiary studies as a preparation to study the degree. And they've got, they get support and they get help. And they then strive to get to a certain level so they're ready to start. Because maybe their ATAR isn't a true reflection of what they, what they were capable of. And often, you know, this, we, you know, Scott referred to that in a sense. And, and Excuse me. Um, Linda. Linda. Thank you. Linda did too in the sense that there's that other element, that uh, social element, which drives it in learning. And if you think of Brockenbrenner and the connection between school and home and all that sort of stuff, and that's just so massive, it's you, to sit down and, and get your ATA right, it's one, it's a, it's a time, it's a little thing in time. And I think that we need to look more and, at I know when I first started as a teacher, we got interviewed. Mm -hmm. And we, we weren't picked just because of our ATAR, or in those days, whatever it was, for me, HSC. And we were interviewed first, and then we got that, uh, what we call a bursary or whatever it was to go on to uni. And I think that needs to come back in. You need, and I think we need to do it with doctors, the whole bunch of things, where we need to have that, they are uh, that ethical. <coughs> Which they do do it. Yeah, they are doing it, but it's only a recent thing because it's not something that's been there for a long time. And I think we need to bring that back into teaching. And it's interesting from my point of view, and Scott referred to before, the first years I get, because I teach first years and second years, mm -hmm. they come in and I have to teach them how to be critical uh, uh, analysers. Yep. Mm -hmm. I say, all right, why did you pick that strategy to work with that child? Oh, because it worked. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no. It's one of the things that worked. What was some of the other? Why did you get rid of all the others? And some of the things I worked with is building um, individual learning plans for students. Mm -hmm. And they have a list this long. You can't deal with them all, as we know with the ILPs. You have to pick a couple and go with it. Which one did you pick? Why did you pick that? Oh, the teacher says a good idea. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Time out. Yeah. 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 yeah, I sort of had two comments just as we were going. Firstly, Parent, that's yeah. my focus. Um, yeah. As a parent, I believe I should be a good teacher too because we're in the same, yes. you get paid for it, good, <laughs> you're a good teacher because if I'm giving you an individual that I'm messing up at home, you can't do much with them, yeah. right? Yes. So exactly. I've got to be a good teacher. So, so yeah. it's, it's a partnership mm -hmm. um, in your team. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So I think the the whole idea of ethics and splitting a piece of bread with your brother, I've got to teach that as well as you and all the other teachers. Um, whether you come from a religious focus or just a be a good person focus, 
we all come from different communities and cultures and the cocktail is huge. And so no surprises by the time you get my daughter, uh, good luck to you. <laughs> we've, already, we've, we've already started this relationship, this talking. Now the other thing I sort of wanted to say, everyone's going, oh we have to get this great result. But again, I loop around. If I give you my daughter and she's not that good at literacy and you've picked that up, then if you've took, dealt with her in that situation, you will be giving her that high score. If you're focusing on her and moving her forward. So I think it's interrelated. We can't just, like you were saying, can't focus just on the score. And I think as teachers, all of us, if we all work on being good people and then that sort of comes with it, they will do their best. My daughter kept on saying, I want to be the best person I can be, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Nice. And you know, and I think this is only, I'm only new to this school and this is one of the things that, that is promoted here about being the best version of yourself. Um, so. Thank you, yeah. thank you for that. And in fact, uh, and certainly the educators again in the room will know that classic pie of Hatties, where teachers are the biggest in school factor, but about half of the pie is the parents. How many books are in the house? How often are children read to? And those sorts of things. So a partnership is absolutely what it's about. I totally, totally agree. Um, because just to kind of right up the back, you do flag, you know, a dominant discourse that we have which is good teaching equals high ATAR scores amongst the students. And it's just been able to challenge that dominant discourse and say, well, hang on a minute. And one of the first things that comes to mind, uh, Monash Uni every 10 years runs this study comparing uh, first year students going through uni, those who have come uh, from private schools and got high ATAR schools, scores and those from public schools, not so. And the students with lower ATAR scores from government schools tend to do better. And so I we need to, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to ask the question as a community, okay, should we buy into this notion of high ATAR full stop? In which case it's very short lived mm. and are we really serving our students the best that we can? Or we say, no, no, the story is actually bigger than that. But in order to change the discourse, we actually need to, put, to participate as a community and say, listen, it's not as simple as good teaching equals ATAR full stop. So I, I do sympathise that that is a pressure, very much so. Yes. And it's going to take a lot of work to try and challenge and change it. And as parents, the parents in the room, and I've got five kids, so I've been through this five times. <laughs> um, you know that when there is, the results come out, the neighbours, the first thing they say, how did so-and-so go? And they really mm -hmm. just want you to tell them what your yeah. child's <laughs> done. Mm -hmm. Down to one number. So I've noticed increasingly, most parents will say, look, they got into what they needed to get into, yeah. we're delighted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't even buy into, if possible, that whole space. Because there's life up here later. There is life up here. And in fact, some of you I'm sure will know about the school, um, Peter Hutton School, which, and I'm seeing a gentleman nod and I'm guessing I know who you are. Um, do you want to comment about what he's doing at, uh, at his school? Peter's actually left Temple State Secretary. Oh, has He's he? He's actually set up a consultancy he to look at to. future schools. Yeah. That's right. And to look at deconstructing the our utter dependence on ATAR yeah. and trying to form new partnerships with universities to actually reshape senior secondary so that it's, we're actually creating optimal conditions for students to learn mm -hmm. without the unnecessary pressures of a single number defining them. And I think they're very healthy moves forward, actually. So Peter's actually interested in, he was actually at our school uh, last Friday, talking about not only is this an Australian-wide phenomenon, but it's actually a worldwide phenomenon where a lot of educators are genuinely questioning what is the most effective way for our young people to learn, to grow and to flourish. Mm -hmm. And I think weaning ourselves off numbers and onto character and virtue and conceptual learning and the opportunity to really grapple with 21st century being, I think they're the things that we need to be focusing on as educators. Mm. I was chatting to a mum whose child has just started at Swinburne Uni doing engineering, and I thought this was fascinating because at Swinburne, in this particular, it's a new course, 
but they're not even calling them undergrads or students, they're calling them associates. Mm. Mm. So the student associates then work in the faculty to, to develop their own knowledge. I th just thought that was a really nice little twist on the, the traditional. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but yes. just this morning I noticed Jeff Masters had a new paper out in um, the Teacher magazine. I don't know if anybody saw it, but again talking about um, why are we continuing to only group students by their age group. Now every day at Berwick Grammar, I have wonderful experiences with my Year Tens, and they're there because they're Year Tens, and we're all there. And so, I'm not suggesting we throw the baby out with the bathwater. However, to actually re-examine some of those structures that we um, just put in place because that's how schools do it, I think is a really important part of that discussion oh, too. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. Someone brought it home to me when they said you're on a beach, and if someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, there's another," I'm not telling you how old I am, but <laughs> you're old over there. You go and play with them, <laughs> and it's just wrong isn't it and yet we seem to do it to children all the time. Um, I've got a, a question for the young ones here and, it's, and I don't expect you to know the answer I just want your sort of estimate. Um, there's been some research that looks into how long does it take a teacher to build up that toolkit, that kit bag, that body of knowledge that makes them a good teacher, that pedagogical knowledge, teaching knowledge that we were talking about that sits separate to the subject. How long do you think the research is uh, indicating that we need to work as teachers before we get to that space? On average, there are exceptions. <laughs> and it's hard based work for the rest of the panel. I think you can do it in two years. Two years? <laughs> one. 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 Okay. <laughs> Julia, what do you think? Be absolutely honest. I was like, on the side of the spectrum, like five, six. Like yeah. four, eight. Yeah, well, it, and it may have been updated, but last time I heard it was about eight years. Eight years to become a good, competent practitioner of this profession, without a doubt. It, it all though, depends on how that eight years went, isn't it? Like That's exactly right. They will put you 100% on eight years or 50% for 20 years. That's exactly right. That's one of Linda's favourite sayings, isn't it? It is indeed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that goes back to where we started, which is the teachers as learners, isn't it? That we all, and parents as learners, we're all learners. We? Yep. I'm wondering with the, the push now coming up from the CCAA with the general capabilities of critical and creative thinking. Yes. Um, the meeting we went to last week, it, it's a real tension now about how do we teach thinking. I'm just wondering, with our young students here, do you feel like you've been taught to become good thinkers and what does that look like in the classroom for you? Um, I think that more recently, especially in older year levels, we've been uh, doing different kinds of things in the classroom that encourage more like creative and critical thinking. Um, especially for me, um, doing history, it's a lot of forming your own opinion about events, not just reciting dates, names and places and that kind of thing. You're actually having your own opinion about what you think and why. And um, not even, like it's easy, I guess, to find more examples in humanity subjects like English and history, it's a lot easier to form your own opinion. But also in sciences, like I also do chemistry and I did methods last year. Um, not just, I mean, obviously it's kind of hard to argue the facts in sciences. There's more evidence behind that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um just your um, thinking of how you approach a question and how you answer something, like, might be a different interpretation to someone else. You can kind of go down that avenue in that kind of thing. I've got a last question for the panel and then we've got a couple of minutes for questions from the floor. So have a think if you've got one. And Scott, I'll start with you again, please. Sorry about this. But just because you work in the tertiary sector, and Stuart, you may have a comment here too. Do you think we can make a good teacher from a poor teacher? No. Um, I don't think you can work with another human being to make them into anything if they don't want to. Uh -huh. And so when we're talking about like the teaching learning relationship, I don't think teaching can ever cause learning. But I think as educators what we should be working on is to enable our students to want to learn. And so the whole notion of uh, trying to encourage greater curiosity, um, developing their own questions that they have a genuine interest and genuine care for, and if we can somehow nurture that. Um, and to enable educators to educate, maybe to sort of 
take a step back, I mean, I would do this in philosophy, and sort of say, well, what kind of society are we aspiring to? We look at our society right now, today, is it perfect? If it's not, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And to feel them, you flagged the notion of empowerment before, and so to feel that they can contribute at least in one small way, and sort of say, oh, well, look, I think we can make society better by, and that kind of draws, this is why we educate. Mm -hmm. This is why we have schools, this is why we invest billions of dollars in the education system. Really and it happy. is, it is a huge investment financially, mm. isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, both in terms of output, expense for the nation, and in terms of input when we think about what we do with our, say, international student market amongst others and, mm. and, and the, the selling of courses. So it is really worthy of discussion and mm. informed discussion. I'd like to throw the space open now uh, mm. to see if there's any questions from the floor. Carol. Mm. It's very interesting because this has been going on obviously I'm a mum of two children and mm -hmm. I've been through quite a few of these. Very few teachers actually come with those sorts of questions. And I find that those teachers who do ask those questions are the teachers who my children like more mm -hmm. and they learn more from mm -hmm. and they do better at. That is, that is a fascinating question and it's interesting because there's a tension and every teacher and parent in the room will know that usually those interviews are fairly short. Mm. We all hate that, mm. can I tell you, the teachers and the families. We all hate it. We'd love to spend, <coughs> excuse me, a lot more time. And I suspect for a lot of teachers, and I'm happy to have other feedback from other teachers in the room too, a lot of teachers think what is it that the parents most want to know usually and with respect, I think that you are a wonderful example of a, a, a sort of an exception uh, in some senses because the, if I were to weigh up as a teacher and the thousands of interviews I've done, nine times out of ten, the parents will say, so what did you get on the last test? Mm -hmm. Or what did he get? Mm -hmm. So you, you sort of cut your cloth accordingly. Um, but I applaud your thinking in that. I think that, that is fantastic and I think we might take that on board. Certainly there are, for teachers that are new to the school, they get some guidelines as to what and how to prepare and what to have with them in the interviews. But it is, it's a space that, as I said, often leads to more challenges than, than deep happiness. Yes, Amber. Just, just to add to that, I, um, I think there's a valid point in that how do we work as a team mm -hmm. to, you know, with good teachers and ourselves and teachers to have more um, crossover through the year. I mean, we all say, oh, you, you know, talk to the teacher if you've got any, you know, thoughts or, you know, questions or anything else. But how do we, as a society, encourage more cross-pollination so that the educators can say, I've noticed this about your child. They're either really interested in this or they learn in this way. What do you think about that? Or I'm thinking about like, a lot more collaboration rather than here we go. We, you know, they, and, they, and I give credit to the educators because they probably know. But at the same time, having that cross, because you only have a few interactions that are scheduled throughout yes. the year. Yes. And most people don't get around to just having that discussion yeah. with an educator to go, a yeah. deep How discussion. are they learning and you know, what are they learning? And I must apologise, I neglected to differentiate. I'm looking at Carol Reed here, the head of junior school, where the parent-teacher interviews are student-led conferences in the junior school. So they operate in a very, very different way. Um, but acknowledging, Amber, exactly what you're saying, and certainly that opportunity for interaction decreases, we know, as a child moves mm. through the school. I will say that's part of the thinking behind having a session like this, is so that though we're not talking about individual children by any means, at least we can get through some of the sort of ideas that inform what and why the schools are doing what they are doing, if that makes sense. 
But uh, no, you raise a, again a very, very good point. It's very difficult within the constraints of the system that we have mm. currently and the time frames that you know, yeah. all, everybody has. So yeah. I, I, just, it, that, I put that out there as a question. Yeah. yeah, and I might add that I think that schools and families are um, connected infinitely more than when I started teaching. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a lot of schools, including ours, have you know online reporting. Mm -hmm. Teachers are readily accessible by email and they usually get back as quickly as they can. Um, so that's sort of, it's, it's a lot different to the notes in the diaries in the old days, which still happens as well in a lot of cases, but um, there are some new methodologies in there. Um, yes, yes. Could good teachers, how do they um, get satisfaction? What, what does a good teacher find? Oh, that's a glorious yeah. question. Yeah, Who'd like to? Okay, we have some really good teachers both out here and I know in the space. So if any teacher out there wants to respond, but Meg, I might start with you. How do you know? So I just add what keeps them happy. What keeps them? What keeps them happy? Hmm. Um, I I love my job because it's really diverse, um, and I'm really passionate about not only the subjects that I teach terms of music and media and digital technologies, but I, I love talking about education, a bit of an education nerd. So having opportunities um, to, to share that with colleagues and to be part of a community. I should admit, I recently worked um, in a different job for two years, and so I've come back into a school, and, and I absolutely love being a part of a community, and that keeps me going, no doubt about it. Mm. Linda, do you want to add a point? Impact. <laughs> Number one, impact. Mm -hmm. How do I impact on the students that I have in front of me, knowing that my why is what their impact will become when they leave secondary school? So it's a long-term view, but the fact that it sounds corny, but I went into education to change the world. Mm -hmm. And that's really why I'm here. And being able to see students, I teach mathematics, which a lot of students, I think, find a little bit challenging and will turn off from. But to have those students bring on board, no matter where their starting point is, knowing that they can actually improve and that I have paid some small part in doing that, that is what gives me the greatest satisfaction. Mm. Stuart, you had a comment? Yeah, I've been a teacher for many years and I'm coming back to what Scott was saying. One of the things I appreciate is when kids challenge me and I think, I think I've done my job because they're not accepting what I've taught them, they're not accepting, and in a good way, I don't mean it's a critical way, I mean, we always get the online stuff, but the, <laughs> 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 look into that. at uni we allow kids to, kids, students to uh, comment on, on how we went as teachers, right, and it gets That's interesting right, things because yeah. it's anonymous. Yeah. 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 But one of the things I find I, in class, when they'll challenge me and say, uh, why, why are we learning this, why, why do we do that, why do you think that, and I'll go, right, we're on the right track here, because mm -hmm. they're doing what I want them to do, like they don't, they're not to take anything in face value, they need to know, and one of the things we do when we send our, teach, our uh, pre service teachers out, we say, when you're out there, what, explain why you are teaching that subject, why are you teaching that particular goal? Well, you know, not that it's in the curriculum. Why the hell is it in the curriculum? Explain that to me. And this is some of the stuff we're pushing them to, to come back in their assessment tasks and their reflections. Yeah. And that indeed links to what Scott was saying again right at the beginning about pushing about their why do you mm. think the earth is flat? Yes. Um, and indeed being provocative in, in a safe space like a classroom in a safe way is, is absolutely crucial. Because where do we get our curriculum? Oh, that's right. Right. It's, well, it's political. A lot of it. Oh, yeah. We can talk for another few hours. The white thing posed yeah. on us it comes from polit politicians a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm referring to one of the comments made earlier about how some students who got really high ETA, they go to uni and they go to fail or just go that's not right. successful as you expect. Um, I, I wonder whether there's a challenge that when we, we have to kind of encourage students uh, to have the learning behaviors like the mm -hmm. resilience and then how to cope with the exams and things like that as such as also personal attributes then then in schools if you do it at the um, senior years or even from the beginning but how do you then measure like i think it has become like a human nature that whatever can be measured has a value. So like eta is one, why is this, why it is, why it has come important. So something to value these things like learning behaviors, 
could come make up an with effect. It. Well, we have got PISA measuring the, um, uh, glo oh, what's it called? The, the, it's a global citizenship measure. Mm. So just as they're measuring the maths and the literacy, mm. they are now measuring uh, skills that they believe relate to intercultural mm. competence. Uh, that is starting this year. But I heard the other day that Britain and America are not going to take part. <laughs> <laughs> Australia, however, is. I, I don't know if anyone in the room is involved in that in any way, because I'd love to know um, how that, and, and I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, that part of that will be they'll be giving the children scenarios mm -hmm. and asking them to explain, you know, what might be a, a, a suitable sort of mm -hmm. course of action and, and e express their knowledge about the world mm -hmm. while doing so. Um, um, adding to what you were saying, uh, earlier the, the panel talks about the IB, which very much has that global citizenship mm -hmm. focus and the development <coughs> of the learner and mm -hmm. the learner profile mm -hmm. and everything like that. I know mm -hmm. that it's been mm -hmm. and some research involved in some research around that too. Mm -hmm. uh, but those students at university, there was a study done in 2007 mm -hmm. and they compared people with the same ATARs from IB conversion mm -hmm. to the, and I believe it was at Melbourne Uni, they don't, it's University C in the yeah. um, you know, write up, but 40% yeah. of uh, VCE students completed the course they enrolled in, whereas it was 60% of IB students. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was mm -hmm. you know, much better correlation between ATAR and GPA. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They just add in the mix though that there's mm -hmm. for a long time been discussion at IB schools as to whether the more st the students that tend to choose IB might be in that mm -hmm. yes. sort of vein yeah. Yeah. anyway. So, yeah. There's a similar study in America yes, where right. the uh, IB students in America, a large scale study, about 11,000 students tracked and they had a 75% completion rate. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, it's a really interesting space. It has to be the last comment from Helen, I think, and then yeah, at the back of we can talk private. Yeah. I'm just conscious people. Yeah, we, we spoke a lot tonight about the, the teacher being an ongoing learner. Given that our curriculum and our timetables are exceptionally pushed in the field, how do we encourage our profession and leaders to protect time for our teachers to have that ongoing learning space to mm -hmm. develop their own professional learning? Well, how, <laughs> I would suggest that some of it is internal, yeah. igniting the thirst in the teacher to say for me to um, learn what I need to know to teach these things is something that I value. Um, I, I, I will say that given the, and we, are, and we all know teachers, as our parents, are exhausted at the end of terms and need that sort of, uh, that time to reflect and, and re-energise over the non-term time. Um, I can see those non-term times becoming increasingly focused on doing a lot of the stuff that we assume happens during term time, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And I know for a lot of teachers in the room, I think we do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see a lot of nods, without a doubt. Um, that is time up. Can I just compliment everyone? as compliment with an eye, that what we have done today has been really quite extraordinary. I can't remember the last time I sat in a room with parents who have really strong, wonderful ideas, with teachers and with university people. It has been a very, very rich, thoughtful space. So I'd like to acknowledge everyone in the room's thinking. Um, and I just wanted to say that we were chatting before about what the next topic we might explore would be. And a uh, very brief discussion. We knew we wanted to do something on sort of well-being and the, the young person. But seeing as we focused on teaching this particular session for the next Unicorn series, which will be in semester two, we thought we'd look at the learning, the student side. And that, of course, will pick up on lots of elements of well-being, I, be I believe it will anyway. So if you are interested in being involved in planning for that or know anyone who might be a good person to be involved, either as a panel member or a question asker, please let us know.